And so I welcome everybody today to the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. I am Douglas Anderson, Dean of the Huntsman School, and it's such a pleasure to welcome this distinguished audience on this beautiful autumn day here in Cache Valley on the third annual uh, Stephen R. Covey Leadership Award Luncheon. Uh, we're especially uh, grateful to and delighted to welcome our honoree, Doug Conant and his wife, Lee. Welcome to Utah State University, Doug and Lee. <laughs> Doug will be more formally uh, introduced following lunch by Stephen M. R. Covey. We're equally delighted to have Stephen and his wife, Jerry, with us. Uh, as well as many other members of the great Covey family and our Covey Center founders and Covey Fellows. Welcome to you all. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Doug and, and Lee are not strangers to Utah. They have been here on at least two other occasions that I know of uh, down at uh, Sundance. Uh, when they were working with, uh, with Stephen. But I don't know if you've ever been here to Cash Valley before, have you? Uh, even though I learned that, uh, that Doug's younger brother is a graduate of Utah State University. So who knew? But we're delighted to, to, to welcome you both here on this beautiful autumn uh, day. I think this may be the last of our beautiful autumn days before it turns uh, cold. We're honored to have the friendship and great support of uh, the great Covey family here at Utah State University and the Huntsman School of Business. And, and to those of you who are making so many wonderful contributions in memory of Stephen R. Covey and the timeless principles that he so effectively taught and lived throughout his life. Stephen Covey was a great influence in my own life, as I know he was for many of you as well. Uh, and, and the way I think about leadership and the way I hope to be uh, a leader, very much heavily influenced by personal interactions that I had uh, with Stephen over many years. Um, I am proud, especially, that during the last two and a half years of his life, Stephen was the tenured full professor carrying the endowed chair. Uh, first time the endowed chair was honored uh, in the name of John M. Huntsman, uh, and we were, we will, that's a special memory for us here at, at uh, the Huntsman School of Business. I know Stephen would have been delighted with our gathering today, and especially so because in just three days, on October 24th, he would have celebrated his 90th birthday. Uh, and he's been gone now a little over 10 years, uh, so today I hope this will be not only a celebration of his ideas, not only a celebration of uh, his birthday, but a great celebration of his life as well. We're honored to be, to, as Stephen taught us all, it, it's so important for us to live, love, and leave a legacy. And we're honored uh, that uh, we have a part of the legacy of Stephen R. Covey here at Utah State University in the Stephen R. Covey Center for Leadership, ably led by Professor Brett Crane, uh, who is the executive director of the center, chaired by his son, Stephen M. R. Covey, uh, and uh, supported by our two Stephen R. Covey endowed professors of leadership, Lord Michael Hastings and Boyd Craig. Won't you join me in thanking them This award has become something of special importance to us in our community. Our purpose at the Huntsman School of Business is to be a career accelerator for our students and an engine of growth for our community, the state, the nation, and the world. Our mission is to develop leaders of distinction in commerce and public affairs, and our strategic objective is to become the premier undergraduate business and economics program in the Intermountain West. The individual chosen to receive this award each year has lived a life exemplary of the high ideals and impact that provides definition for our mission and that we hope will inspire our students to emulate. We could not be more pleased or grateful that Doug and Lee Conant have accepted our invitation to join us today. 
in honor of Stephen's marvelous life and his enduring impact. Doug, you've been generous with your time and your wisdoms already today, uh, and yet we are eager to learn more from you uh, before you and Lee must depart. But now is time for lunch. And following lunch, a great ceremony presided over by Stephen M.R. So enjoy lunch, everyone, and welcome. As we uh, commence our formal uh, presentation of the, the moment that brings us here together today, as uh, the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center in the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University, as today we will present the Stephen R. Covey Principal Centered Leadership Award to Doug Conant. And I'll announce that in just a moment. I just wanted to, um, I'm Stephen M. R. Covey, and, and, uh, and then the chairman of the, the Covey Center, work with uh, Brett Crane, who's the executive director of the center, and with Boyd Craig, the vice chairman, and David Covey's the chairman of our founders group. And, uh, and, and then, of course, uh, Boyd Craig and uh, Lord Hastings are the Stephen R. Covey Professors of Leadership. On behalf of the Dean and all of us, we're honored to be here today to present this award. The Stephen R. Covey Principal Centered Leadership Award is presented annually to a renowned global leader who models the achievement of two ends simultaneously, world-class performance and outcomes for all stakeholders achieved in and through a principle-centered approach. Both dimensions are vital. How a principle-centered leader achieves results is as important as the results themselves. A principle-centered leader gets results the right way. A principle-centered leader's leader delivers results in a way that honors principles, in a way that honors people, in a way that inspires trust, in a way that addresses the needs of all stakeholders, in a way that enhances social value in a way that serves worthy purposes in society and in a way that endures. What they do matter matters. What they do matters and how they do what they do similarly matters. Our recipient of this award today is a person who exemplifies this approach to leadership, getting results the right way through principles. Um, I will speak to our honoree, Doug Conant. He is an extraordinary person, uh, genuine, real, humble, um, brilliant, talented. Um, and his leadership story is quite remarkable. Um, we know you've read in, in the preparation for today, he was the former president of Nabisco Foods, and under his leadership, they had the five most um, profitable and best-run financial years in their history, in addition to him turning around the culture from swamp water to champagne. He then became the CEO of the Campbell Soup Company and over a decade led that company and, and led really a turnaround there, similar to what happened at Nabisco Foods, that was a turnaround both in terms of financial performance from the bottom tier to the top tier in economic value created, but also in terms of doing it in the way that inspires trust and grows the people as they went from literally the very bottom of the Fortune 500 in employee engagement to the very top, to world-class engagement. Again, getting results in a way 
that honors and grows people. Um, he, since then, has done many things, including being the chairman of Avon and helped in their strategic redirection as, as well as their culture, as well as serving as the chairman of the board of the um, chief executive, chief executives for corporate purpose, and of the Higher Ambition Leadership Institute, which are remarkable organizations trying to view uh, society, trying to enable leaders in business to view society as one of the primary stakeholders that they have. In other words, that we have a stewardship to society as business leaders. So I could go on and on about his accolades. He's a, um, a New York Times best-selling author of Touch Points and of The Blueprint. And, and um, he is a, a top 100 leadership speaker, an innovator, and social media influencer. Um, and, uh, and again, more than anything else, he is also a genuine, um, authentic, real human being who models the principles that we espouse here at the Covey Center of Principal Center Leadership. So with no further ado, I would ask if Dev Conant could come up here. And join me, and on behalf of the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center in the John Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University, we present to Doug the Stephen R. Covey Principal Centered Leadership Award for his extraordinary and exemplary leadership. didn't break. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we're going to do a couple pictures before his remarks, is it? We'll do a couple pictures and then we will hear from Doug. I think Doug and I first and then, and then right after, if we could have you come up, Lee. Doug's wife, Lee, is with us today. We're grateful for that. And when Lee comes up, if the, the other leaders at the center could come with it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Lee and, and then Boyd, Brett, and Dean, Dean Anderson, want to come up? Yeah. And Gord Hastings. brought the whole gang hey, for this one. Hail, hail, the gang's all here. <laughs> hey there, Isla. Okay. Wow, that's a tough act to follow, uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, Stephen Amar, thank you uh, for that kind of introduction. You presented it uh, just the way I wrote it, so uh, well done. Although you embellished a little bit, you stole some of my material, but I'll muddle through anyway. Uh, Dean Anderson, wherever you are, th thank you very much for hosting this event. I understand you've been Dean here 16 years now? And you're going to stay here until you get it right. <laughs> so, uh, it takes uh, us a little longer than in the corporate world to do the turnaround. No. But I have to say, it's going well. It's going well. Well, good. Uh, all kidding aside, it's a, a wonderful institution you're running, and I thank you for your hospitality. Thank you. 
uh, and it's great to be with all of you here today. Stephen M. R. said, well, you might want to have some prepared remarks. And uh, he put the pressure on me, so I actually had to prepare some remarks. Fortunately, there are not too many of them, and you can't see, but they're big type, so we're going to get through this just fine. Uh, it's a particular honor to have my life's work in leadership recognized by the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center. You know, back in the early 1990s, my wife and I, Lee, Lee, we were living out east, and I read this book by this obscure professor from Utah. It was, of course, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Who was this guy? After finishing the book, I remarked to my wife, Lee, I said, honey, this guy is brilliant. And she, when she asked me why, I said, because he thinks just like I do. <laughs> and he did. All kidding aside, uh, Stephen put words and structure to my leadership instincts and beliefs like no other. What a gift. What a gift to have someone start to bring clarity to all of that, your instincts and thoughts. Shortly thereafter, I began traveling to Sundance annually to work with Stephen and his team at the Covey Leadership Center. Of particular note, I had a wonderful working relationship with Blaine Lee, Meta Norgard, and uh, Craig Pace. Hard to believe that was nearly 30 years ago. We were just kids. Uh, my experiences with Covey leadership in those early days occurred right after I'd been recruited into the Wild West of the world's largest LBO, leverage buyout at the time, RJR Nabisco. It was acquired by KKR for $27 billion back in 1988-89. The story of that LBO was chronicled in a best-selling book, Barbarians at the Gate, and then made into a full-length movie. I entered the Nabisco side of the LBO as the general manager of their smallest and most challenging division. Over the next five years, I had a string of assignments that ultimately culminated in my being named president of Nabisco Foods Company. And then over the next five years, the Nabisco Foods Company was arguably the best performing food company in the world. What a fulfilling piece of work. But don't let that performance fool you. It was an extraordinarily challenging chapter in my corporate life. The LBO environment created a toxic level of dysfunction that was totally foreign to this kid from the Midwest. Uh, that being said, once we overcame the challenge of that environment, we felt as if we were ready for almost anything. And you know what? We were. Among other things, my work with the Covey Leadership Center helped get me through those trying times. Some of those early experiences are actually chronicled in a chapter in Stephen's book, Living the Seven Habits, published now, hard to believe, over 20 years ago. Uh, I believe, in fact, I know the center's own Boyd Craig was part of that writing team. That's where you and I first connected. Following that experience, I became CEO of Campbell Soup Company for the next decade, the first decade of the new millennium, and I continued to benefit from the learning experience with Stephen and his team. Campbell Soup Company was one of the largest diversified food companies in the world in 38 countries, products marketed in 125 countries. Of course, we were the leading soup company. After all, soup was our middle name, Campbell Soup Company. Uh, but we were also the leading vegetable juice company in the world, the brand you would know would be v V8, and we were the third largest baked snacks company in the world, the brand you would know would be Pepperidge Farm, or most likely if you have, if you have young children, Goldfish. <laughs> Goldfish is the best ch selling children's snack in the world. Uh, unfortunately, we were also the poorest performing food, major food company in the world, headquartered in the poorest, most dangerous city in the United States, Camden, New Jersey, 75,000 people, 70 murders a year, unfathomable. And our leading product, soup, was being compared to a buggy whip by the leading industry analyst because it was an old economy product, hadn't changed in 100 years, and the world was passing us by. And you know what? It was. 
during the decade we were there, we rebuilt the organization and took employee engagement, as Stephen mentioned, from worst in the Fortune 500 to the best. We put the company on solid strategic footing, delivered consistently strong financial results, and most importantly to me, we began to transform the, the communities in which we operated. Stephen and my friends at Covey Leadership Center were a critical beacon of light during that period of time. There were some dark days with the Campbell turnaround. In fact, as I prepared to retire in 2011, Stephen was kind enough to come speak at my final pre-retirement global leadership meeting in Philadelphia. Uh, he was not doing these events anymore, but he made the trip from Utah to Philadelphia to attend this event for me. I will always be grateful for that opportunity. Little did I knew, know that that would be the last time I would see him. He gave me a talking stick that I have sitting on my desk. So when I talk to myself, I have somebody to listen. <laughs> Those of you, many of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, my work with the Covey family hasn't ended there. Over the past decade, I've come to know, respect, and learn from his son, Stephen M. R. To say he's a chip off the old block is an understatement and doesn't really talk to his great value to this world. He has taken much of his father's thinking, particularly around the nature of trust building, and taken it to an entire, entirely new level for entirely new generations of aspiring leaders. Uh, we are lucky to have him in our midst. I greatly respect his capacity to help people, and I value his friendship. Most of the time. Uh, all the time. If that's not enough, I now have the honor, the joy, and the opportunity to work with his daughter, McKinley, on a part-time basis. I value her perspective, her enthusiasm, her energy, and she's a darn good writer. And so I'm enjoying the collaboration with her. The cherry on top is that Stephen M. R.'s son, and Jerry, Stephen, Jerry's son, uh, Britton, now plays for the Philadelphia Eagles in the NFL as You'd have to live under a rock here not to know that. But uh, my headquarters are in Philadelphia. And I have a feeling that my executive assistant in Philadelphia, Diana Hansen, who is a diehard Eagle fan, could very well be recruited to start the Britton Covey fan club <laughs> in the Philadelphia chapter. She typed this, so she approved that. <laughs> So my roots with the Covey family and the Covey Leadership Center run three generations deep. Uh, what a blessing. What a blessing. And it's been wonderful, parenthetically, to just come here and celebrate that with you today. However, what is most relevant to this discussion is the fact that the roots of my leadership philosophy are most congruent with the philosophy of the Leadership Center itself. And my roots have been shaped by 40 years of actual in-the-trenches experience in the corporate arena. That's 14, that's 100 and, no, excuse me, that's 14,600 days grinding it out with budgets and challenges every day with people, or 150,000 hours of actual experience in those trenches. I have studied it, and I have most certainly lived it. Based on that in the trenches experience, I'm here to testify that while philosophical congruence is nice, the principle-centered approach to leadership that I've practiced and that is advocated by the center has, can, and will deliver enduring high-performance results, financial and otherwise. I guarantee it. Okay, with that preamble behind us, let's talk about the state of the world today. It's crazy with a capital C, wouldn't you say? I would say so. Who could imagine? Who could imagine? How many of you expect it to get crazier in the days ahead? Yeah, me too. In 1987, another mentor of mine who recently passed, Warren Bennis, is credited with coining the term a VUCA world. V-U-C-A, VUCA world. Does anybody know what that stands for? Okay, David, you get, what's the first one? Volatile. Volatile. Dave, okay. I won't make you go through it. Volatile, 
uncertain, complex, ambiguous. That was his description of the world in 1987. Today, 35 years later, I would call it a VUCA world on steroids. Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, with not great prospects to get better. As aspiring leaders of our families, our communities, our places of work in the broader world, the question arises, well, how can we, how can we help move things forward in the midst of these, what I'll call choppy VUCA seas, okay? The short answer is that we must first make sure that our rudder is in the water. Otherwise, we will become lost at sea in our leadership efforts. The rudder is the means of steering the boat. No rudder, no control, no sense of direction. If we want to contribute to our communities, we have to have our rudder in the water, we have to have control, and we have to have a sense of direction. Now, as most, if not all of you know, Stephen basically wrote the book on getting your rudder in the water, and it's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. In my words, it's all about the never-ending pursuit of mastering one's effectiveness with others by employing very in a very intentional inside-out process to help get one's rudder in the water, first privately, or the inner world, inner life, then privately and then publicly, and eventually in a continuous improvement fashion, sharpening the saw. Basically, my book, The Blueprint, that Stephen M. R. referenced in the introduction, and for which he wrote the foreword, and I will always appreciate that, thank you, takes a similar track. However, it's more explicitly designed for the VUCA world of today and is more business oriented as we endeavor to help people get unstuck on their leadership journeys in this tough, tough world. I personally run a two day, very intense blueprint boot camp with a lot of pre-work ahead of time before we even get to those two days. However, I'm told I only have a few minutes today, so I'm gonna to cut to the chase. And I have only one point I wanna make, but you're gonna to have to be part of the of, of me making that point. I want you to get a glimpse of what is possible. And in that regard, it's now time for a little audience participation. I'd like each of you to think of a person who has had a profound impact on you. You're gonna to have to share this with someone else, so you better be thinking about this. Think of a person who's had a profound impact on you, and you know what? You carry the lessons from them with you to this very day. Could be a teacher, a coach, a grandparent, a parent. Very rarely is it a boss. That's a sad thing. Uh, except in my case, my wife is my boss, and I've got lots of lessons from her. <laughs> okay, you have that person in mind? I want you to turn to the person next to you. You're going to have to figure that out. I'm going to split up the Andersons. You're going to talk to Lord Hastings. You two know each other well enough. And then you three can share here. You guys will figure this out. Uh, I'd like you to uh, take the next 90, take, each take 90 seconds and share with your table mates the person you're thinking of and what made them so special for you. So you've got 90 seconds. In, a, in some cases, you'll be three, so that's three times 90. That's just a few minutes, and I'm going to be tough on time here. So go.
Okay, you should be moving on to person number two now. Okay, you have a one minute warning, one minute. Okay, here we go. I always lose the group when I do this. But uh, this podium makes enough noise. We get, get your attention. Uh, I, think we ma I think I made the point. In fact, I know I made the point. How was that experience? Pretty cool, right? Pretty cool to reflect on people who have had such a powerful impact on you in your life. Uh, would someone share an observation from, uh, just blurt it out. We're, you're my friends here. Come on. Roger, what did you observe? Perfect. That's perfect. Thank you. That wasn't so bad, was it? No, that was all right. Well, you, yeah, I thought you did real well. We, weren't, we didn't prepare for this. That, that was very good. Uh, you know, uh, did the person that you were describing to the people at your table, did they have high standards? My experience is most definitely yes in every room, in every kind of conversation. The answer to that is the affirmative. Yes, they had high standards. Did, they, did that person genuinely care about you? Did you feel as if they cared about you? So they had high standards for you, and they cared about you. Okay. In the fullness of time, has that experience with that person helped you get your rudder in the water a little bit more fully as you think about how you choose to lead people? Typically, the answer is yes. Now, I, before I close, I'd like to share with you my story, since I didn't have anybody to talk to, uh, about Neil McKenna. Neil McKenna was, uh, I was fired from a job, very surprisingly, which I've shared a couple times, so I'm not going to share this with you other than, the, I was very surprised and uh, was sent home packing after working for a company for almost 10 years. 
And uh, they gave me the name of this outplacement counselor who I called late in the afternoon that day. His name was Neil McKenna. And he was a gifted outplacement counselor. He was also out, an outplacement counselor to all the Harvard Business School MBAs who were out of work. Harvard channeled them to him. So this guy was the real deal. Uh, he was a tough New Englander who had been left for dead during World War II in, in France and survived with a limp. And I didn't know what to expect. So I called him late in the afternoon, the day I was fired, and said, Mr. McKenna, I've been given your name. I'm sort of in shell shock. I did not, I'm not prepared for this. I have a wife, two small children, and one very large mortgage. And I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, I'd like to get on your schedule and make an appointment. He said, well, I want you to come right over. I said, it's 4 o'clock. I don't want to impose on Come right over. So I drove 40 minutes over to where his offices were. And uh, he was there for me completely. We sat and talked. And we talked some more. And he asked questions. It wasn't about him. It was all about me. And uh, to preface this conversation, when I called him, he answered the phone, and he answered the phone the same way every time I called for the next 20 years as he became a friend and mentor. He would always answer the phone saying, Neil McKenna, how can I help? There were no cell phones. There was no caller ID. We had just gotten past rotary phones. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and. Uh, he didn't know who was calling, but he was there to help. Could have been the president of Harvard, could have been me. Neil McKenna, how can I help? And every time I saw him, the conversation started out with, how can I help? So he cared deeply about me, and I could tell, and he wanted to understand my situation. At the same time, he said, Doug, you're never going to get a job. You're a horrible interview. You're an introvert. You only answer the questions that are asked of you. You don't show any energy. The fact was, I was an introvert, and I felt awkward. And I had a family to mouths to feed and things to do. I was a deer in the headlights. He said, you're never going to get a job. We're going to have to figure this thing out. Uh, so while he loved me unconditionally, he was tough on me. And he knew he had to be to help me find my way through the outplacement process. And he did. And longer stories, many stories about how I learned to find my way through that terrible episode. But it was on the back of my conversations with Neil McKenna. Like many of you, the people you just talked about, they cared deeply about you. They had high standards for you. They wanted to see you prosper. In my language, Neil was tough-minded on standards and tender-hearted with people. And if there's a line I would encourage you to remember from me today, it would be that. Be tough-minded on standards and tender-hearted with people. It's all about the principle of abundance. It's not one or the other, or it's both. When I went into the corporate world, what are you going to be, tough or nice? You know, this is, this is a man's game. Tough. you got to be tough. And you did. But it never fit me because I cared too much about people. I couldn't find my way through it. I finally discovered that I could be both. I could be tough-minded on standards and tender-hearted with people. Neil helped me get my rudder in the water in a meaningful way, just like the people you talked about helped get you get the rudder in the water for yourself. Let me use one more metaphor before I close, uh, and that's parenthood. We certainly are not all parents here. But we have all been children. When our parents were at their very best, I would contend that they maintained high standard for us and they loved us completely. When they were at their best, they had high standards and they loved us completely. In their own way, they had a profound impact on us and in so doing, helped us get our rudder in the water a little better. Look, the pursuit of leadership excellence can be a very daunting exercise. You know, we have a whole school dedicated to it here. The important thing for each of you to remember is that you know exactly what leadership excellence looks like. You know what it feels like. 
you've experienced it in breakthrough moments with the people that you just talked about. These people had a profound influence on you in your life, an influence that you carry with you to this very day. If you want to be a more impactful leader, parent, and friend, it's not rocket science. Simply be more like them. You can do this. You've seen it in action. You know how it works. Be tough-minded on standards. Be tender-hearted with people. Help your colleagues, your friends, your family navigate the very choppy VUCA seas of their lives. Help them get their rudder in the water. They need your help. Start today. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're, we're running a little overtime, and we want to respect schedules, so they're huddling down here trying to figure out, what are we going to do? Uh, your call. Okay, your call. I just work here for you. That was fabulous. Let's see. Um, we don't need a chair. We're just going to, we're going to do one. We're going to ask one question. Um, first of all, that was fabulous. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks so much for being here. Um, my father's last big idea is a brand new book that my sister Cynthia finished. Right here, Cynthia. Everyone knows Cynthia? And uh, she just wrote the book with my father. They had been working on this for four years together before he passed away. And then uh, Cynthia just completed it. It was published three weeks ago. And it was called, it's called Live Life in Crescendo. The idea that your most important work is always ahead of you. You know, in music, crescendo is where everything goes up and dimiendo, it goes down. And the whole idea is that there's a crescendo mentality. Your greatest contributions are still in front of you. With all that you've achieved um, in, in these different organizations, all that you're doing, Doug, um, it'd be very easy to rest upon your laurels <laughs> and say, I've done it. But you, to me, are a great illustration of the crescendo mentality, living life in crescendo, and the spirit of this last big idea of my, my father's, of the, of the Covey Center. What excites you as you look forward? Well, I'm going to, bear with me, I'm going to add a 60-second story here. Margaret Rudkin was the founder of Pepperidge Farm. And uh, it was acquired by Campbell Soup Company in the 1960s. And she was the first woman CEO. Uh, she also wrote the first uh, New York Times best-selling cookbook. She did all kinds of amazing, she was an amazing woman. And I had the opportunity to get to know her secretary. She had long since passed, but her corporate secretary, secretary would come to my annual meetings. And he was about 90 when he was coming with me. But I would ask him about her, and he would tell me this practice she always had. She would always, every meeting, she's, she would want to know what was going on. And every meeting, she would end with, that's good, what's next? She was always celebrating the moment and always looking to move forward in some compelling way. I sort of feel that way, you know? This is good, what's next? Uh, what's next for me is to continue to contribute and continue to try and build a better world and uh, do that in partnership with my bride, my wife, and our family. And uh, we'll see where the winds take us, but uh, we will make a better world, and we will make a difference. And that, that's the best answer I can give you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We are really so grateful to you, Lee, and to Doug for coming out for receiving this award, for being such an example of it. 
we're humbled and honored by it. And uh, we thank all of you as founders, as friends of the center, as students, as, as uh, faculty and staff and part of the team. We're grateful for your support and your involvement for what the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center stands for. We are grateful to have Lord Hastings here. He is the first recipient of the Stephen R. Covey Principal Centered Leadership Award. And there could not have been a better way than to start this off than with him as a recipient. Last year, we had Indra Nui, former CEO of PepsiCo, as our next recipient, and now Doug Conant. So you can see that this is rarefied air that we're operating in. Uh, we just thank you all, and we wish you every success. God bless. Thank you. <laughs>